Uh, all right. So today, um, the sort of general plan is I'm going to give you a little bit of a background on the program, what it is, what we teach, uh, as well as a bit of an introduction to the kind of teaching that we do. Um, so something you can walk away from this webinar knowing a little bit more about what digital experience means. A um, little bit of our uh, breakdown of the things we're going to do today, an introduction to myself and the program. Um, and we're going to look at a couple examples, um, specifically designing or the thoughts around design for things like airports, big systems that include lots of parts, um, but more specifically websites and other digital interfaces, things like tipping interfaces, which have become really prominent and prevalent in today's society. So we're going to look at a bunch of different things. And by the end of the hour, uh, you should have a pretty good understanding of what digital experience design is and how it fits into a larger digital context. Uh, all right, yeah, and Sean did the land acknowledgement. Very good. Uh, I do have the chat open, so if at any point in the presentation, as Sean said, if you have questions, let me know, uh, and I'll be able to get to them uh, as soon as I finish my thought. Uh, introduction for myself, uh, I'm a graduate of the University of Alberta. I uh, graduated from there in 2010, um, and then I went on to do my master's at the Rhode Island School of Design in Providence, Rhode Island, uh, and then came back to Canada to work a little bit here, did some freelance, started working uh, as a sessional teacher at McEwen, um, and worked alongside the faculty here to launch the Digital Experience Design Initiative, which alongside the continuing education programs is also a series of courses within the main degree program, as well as one of the first uh, majors that can be declared uh, within uh, an academic degree um, in digital experience design, which is pretty exciting. Um, we're sort of setting ourselves up as uh, one of the leading schools in Canada for digital experience design. Uh, a lot of the same content comes from that as well, uh, that we have developed a lot of this stuff based on human-centered design practices. Uh, and this stuff comes from this idea that design is not necessarily just about making things look good, although we do spend some time doing that, but making things visual is about making the world a better place, about helping people out, solving problems, uh, and being able to provide some sort of real value to people through design, through that problem solving. Uh, the ori original concept for the Digital Experience Design Certificate Program uh, is four courses, uh, the sort of backbone of the material we teach here, even in the degree side. Uh, so these compose uh, essentially two degree granting courses, uh, same material, same scope, um, although offered here within these four courses over the course of a year. Uh, DXD 101, which is our general introduction to the concept of digital experience design, starts off pretty accessible and pretty uh, uh, low to the ground with things like websites, where we introduce a couple of the main con concepts and principles for the courses. Uh, and then we build on that subsequently in 102, we talk a little bit more about apps and app design and how do we start to approach problem solving in a more task-based focused. Um, 103 is a little bit more advanced where we get into a little bit more complex interaction where you have digital systems that require a little bit more input and collaboration with the user, where they're filling out forms and things like that, which get a little bit complicated as users have more choice. And then 104 uh, is the culmination of this strategic package, which is about giving more creative control to the participants, where you get to do a little bit more adventurous work in that course, where you get to create things that have a little bit more creative freedom, um, but also get to be a little bit more forward thinking in what they're doing, uh, as it's more about new platforms and new trends and technologies that are happening right now. Uh, what you can expect from this program if you were to get into it, uh, these are highly engaged and interactive courses. We spent a little bit of time experimenting with online delivery and remote delivery during the pandemic. Uh, we found that it just doesn't work for this kind of material. Uh, and often the best example of teaching this kind of interaction happens in the classroom and in person. Uh, and I'm very much an advocate of that kind of learning, uh, highly engaged and interactive learning. Uh, we'll have you conduct design projects that are created to be both relevant locally and within a wider context, so that if you're taking our courses, you can see yourself being a part of the design space, both here in the city, uh, if you were to go on and join a company here locally, or to take this and move on elsewhere, uh, designing into places that are maybe in Toronto or maybe even in other countries. Uh, we've designed these courses around accessible workflows, where even though we're designing for digital interfaces, there is no code 
or knowledge of code required here, that we teach the skills outside of the sort of development space, um, the sort of uh, code and programming space. So we talk a little bit about code, what code is and how it affects the things we make and why things look the way we, we, they do. We're not required to know how to do any coding to do the projects in these courses. It's a diverse cohort where we've uh, combined our classes with the uh, the international school to be able to develop a really uh, uh, diverse range of students in the classroom, bring a bunch of different perspectives to the table, which is really great for human centered design courses to be able to have multiple different people who see the world differently in the same classroom together, working on stuff alongside each other. Uh, and all this stuff was developed alongside uh, a series of faculty here. So there is a really comprehensive view uh, behind the desk as well, where we have uh, Robert Andruco, who leads our design program, uh, and our full-time faculty, Isabel Sperano, who holds a PhD in information architecture, uh, both of them bring many years of experience to the strategy behind these courses. Uh, Michael Lucio and myself, who worked alongside them uh, as sessionals to develop a lot of the course material, uh, has been inside the city working on things, but also teaching for many years. Uh, Michael teaching the uh, website development courses here in the mainline de uh, degree program. Uh, when we put together these courses, we were looking a lot at what people needed. Uh, so a big strategy uh, handed down to us from uh, Robert Andruco is that we wanted our students to be able to easily fit themselves into the context of the digital space here in Edmonton. So we developed a lot of our material and our strategy based in consultation with local companies. So companies like uh, Yellow Pencil, um, Paul Bellows and sort of their crew there doing a lot of work with us in the early days to figure out what was needed from students graduating from these programs. What kind of work, what kind of thinking did they need to be able to do uh, in order to be successful? And so we put that into the courses we teach here. Uh, on the other side of things, the so Digital Innovation Office uh, is the internal development group uh, at the Alberta government working on digital initiatives. Um, and that became really relevant during the pandemic as a lot of things need to be digital very quickly. Um, and a lot of stress tests were put on things on a day-to-day -day basis. There's a lot of hardworking people behind the scenes making sure that all that stuff looks and feels great uh, uh, as you're working on it. Uh, and so these people have been really instrumental in making sure that we are going in the right direction uh, with these courses. Some of the stuff that I'm bringing to the classroom, specifically into the DxD courses, uh, is I was trained in human-centered design methods. That was sort of my specific focus uh, and bring a lot of stuff to Edmonton from my experience down in the States. Uh, in grad school, as also as well as some of my experience working in New York for The Economist, for their digital, exper digital experience design and research development team. And then also over in uh, on the West Coast with Microsoft, where I worked a little bit with their research design uh, group, where they were looking a lot at the future of user experience design, specifically around AI and virtual reality, spatial computing. A lot of this stuff is just becoming reality for a lot of us now. Uh, has been in the works for many years, and it was part of what I was working on with them. And how do we design these technologies to be human-centered and to develop them with an idea of uh, empowering and making people's lives better? Uh, the idea of these courses is to give students a little bit of an opportunity to practice this stuff. Um, it's not just about these big ideas of what can be good and how do we have design do good things, but also to let people try it out. Uh, for the last couple of years, one of our big tentpole projects was designing an app for the uh, reservation campsite reservation system for the federal government. Uh, and so for many years, they didn't really have a native application on iPhone or Android that you could download and use. It was all through a website and it didn't really work super great. Um, and there's a big trend that happened over the last 10 years in what we call digital transformation, old systems that need to be updated to new technologies uh, and this project is a great example of that. Here's an example from a past student work, uh, translating that into a design system. We're teaching a lot of the principles and guidelines behind really big design systems from Apple and from Google, uh, allowing the students to translate that into graphics for themselves. The projects you work on uh, have a very, very distinctive structure to them. And we talk a lot about this in all of our courses. Uh, bring it back to this very clear start and end point. Uh, 
giving people an understanding of what it takes to develop projects. It's not just about a final deliverable, but it's how you get there. Uh, so all of our projects have a same, same starting point. Each student takes their own diff different path through it. Uh, and along the way, you get iterate, you iterate a lot on projects based on feedback from myself and from your peers, uh, from research and the interviews you do with users. Uh, and you progress your skills progressively from course to course to course uh, as you work to sort of visualize the ideas you're coming up with. Uh, this structure maps to what we call a double diamond process where there are two distinct phases, the first diamond being mostly about research, and the second diamond being a little bit more about how do you use that research to solve problems. And you can kind of consider this like problem finding in the first space, and then solving some of those problems that you found. Uh, and so by the end of it, you have a really concise story about how you develop projects and ideas. Uh, and you can use that to communicate what you do to other people, whether that's in an interview with somebody you might want to work with in the future, or potentially to a client if you're doing your own design work, uh, or you're working professionally at that point. Really great, effective visual communication tools, uh, and the backbone of all the design work we do here at McEwen. Uh, and this is a for a sort of universal or meta practice uh, that we can apply to everything that we work on, whether they be websites, things that we find very typically in the world. Uh, you probably visit many dozens of websites every single day, uh, hundreds upon hundreds of thousands every single year. Uh, they are as common as the air we breathe, uh, but actually have quite a lot of things to think about and to consider when designing them. And so we get into some of those foundational elements of design for websites, whether it be, why do we have the navigation bar at the top of the page? Why do we structure things page inside page inside page the way we do? Uh, and how to design a homepage, a sort of big uh, early lesson that we have people tackle. But just to say we don't necessarily talk about uh, some of the other digital things, um, beyond just the typical websites, we do talk a lot about new technologies, where technology is going. Uh, designing into this space is specifically challenging, as well as teaching into this space is challenging, because this stuff changes all the time. Uh, there is every year new technologies being released, being developed, being talked about, uh, and they're all being built off of the last generation. So as you develop more understanding of what's out there, you develop a lot of uh, skills in terms of being able to design for new things as they come up. Uh, and so we talk a lot about a lot of these new trends and new technologies and think about how to design for them a little bit. We take a lot of lessons from the past. Uh, and so you might have things like uh, Windows 8, which is sort of one of the bigger stories of digital technology from the past. So you have Windows that tried to reinvent itself and launch this example of uh, windows to the world, where you have uh, a very new layout, very new structure to be explored, uh, and a lot of people who used it hated it. Uh, and this is one of the first key lessons that I think the world learned about that digital technology and designing digital products doesn't just mean solving a problem. There's a whole host of emotional qualities that go alongside it, that people have an emotional connection to the things they use, and they will respond with emotions uh, in kind. Uh, and so that sort of very strong hate that we had for this uh, uh, was a big part of shaping the future of Microsoft afterwards. Uh, they learned a big lesson that day. And there's a lot of those examples in Microsoft's history, whether it's Clippy, uh, the sort of uh, personified paperclip that they designed uh, even before Windows 8 uh, is also in sort of this like hall of shame at Microsoft. Uh, and when I was there, when we were working on AI projects, uh, one of the things we heard a lot was we just don't want this to be another Clippy. Uh, it is this ghost that hangs over that company and is responding to this very emotional reaction. In the classroom, we'll also typically talk a lot about the new things that are coming out, uh, what's happening in the present day, uh, and that we have new technologies, new AIs, new intelligent systems, and it can be very complicated to figure out like what is the design here? Uh, you know, so if you have, so Simon in the chat says here, Bixby, all the new AIs are all built off of these, uh, you know, past learnings. We're coming with all kinds of new predictive technologies that are being embedded into services. Um, the example here from Amazon, the a couple of years ago, they started to develop uh, a grocery store, an intelligent predictive grocery store, integrating AI with cameras and uh, e-commerce platforms, all in this sort of seamless experience where you walk into the store, you 
walk up to a shelf, you pick up your favorite product, whether it's a bottle of kombucha or uh, you know a cherry pie, and you uh, put that into. Oh, wait a second here. I lost my screen. One second. Anyway, let's just rearrange this a little bit. Okay. Hold on one second. I lost my second monitor here. Okay. All right. I just want to double check now that I'm sort of back. Do you can you all see the the screen in the presentation again? Yeah, it's all good on my end, Alex. All good. Okay, cool. Uh, where was I? Oh yeah, Amazon Go. Um, so the grocery store here was sort of supposed to be this seamless experience where people can walk into the grocery store, picking their favorite product off the shelf, walking out of the store, never having gone to a checkout counter, never having uh, sort of scan any item. It is a system that you just do what you would normally would want to do. Uh, and is the intelligence systems behind the counter, behind the, the rack of products that does all that thinking for you and automatically charges whatever you picked up to your online account. Uh, and so these kinds of things are going to become more and more common as we integrate predictive and artificially intelligent systems into all of our products. Uh, but it takes a good deal of creativity and understanding of people to know what those products should actually feel like. Uh, and so we're playing around with a lot of these ideas as we sort of figure out how to teach you about the products that exist now and the products that will exist in the future. Some of the things that we have people do in these courses is come up with these products, especially in 104, where you're given a little bit more forward thinking leeway to take up projects that spark your interest. And so one of the framing products for that is Netflix, a big digital service that is changing a lot of the ways in which we relate to and consume media, so TV and movies. And so we have students come up with ideas about what you would you what would you like to see from that experience how would you like to present that to uh, a new user base adding value to that platform and so you have people coming up with a whole host of new features and additions uh new experiences that define that product and so here a product from a uh, past student integrating a kind of like browsing adjuster to the experience uh, to change how you navigate through all the choices that Netflix gives you And so with all these examples of digital experiences and the idea of designing a digital product, there's always a big question about what is experience? What are we teaching? How do you do, how do you design something that is that big and that sort of uh, all encompassing? Uh, and in the industry, you'll see a lot of people talking about things as digital experience or customer experience or user experience. There's a lot of acronyms going on here. And the idea is that we are designing things here. It's not just about screens. Screens are the thing we end up putting our stuff onto. But the things we're teaching you and the things that you learn about are a little bit more than just screens. You'll see these uh, acronyms a lot. Uh, we call our program Digital Experience Design, specifically because it is about digital products. But we're pulling in things from the world of user experience design, which is much bigger, more broad. Uh, user interface design, which is more, more about the graphics, uh, customer experience design, which is about studying people who are making purchases specifically. Uh, and all these things kind of interweave into what we're talking about in our projects. But what they all have in common is this idea of thinking about the user and what they're doing as an experience. That you're relating to the digital technology as something that you're connecting to emotionally, that you're trying to navigate a little bit more visually, and that anyone who had tried to do any work or connect with people over the pandemic, you can kind of relate to this, that talking with somebody over through a screen is a very different experience. You feel it as being different than if you were just talking to them in person. The digital adds something new. There's something else that it adds that changes those interactions 
And so we have to think about this as we become more and more digital. Uh, the pandemic introducing a whole, whole host of remote work options and people are spending more and more time behind the screen. Uh, trends in behavior around uh, lifestyles and screens changed a lot during the pandemic uh, and has continued on this, in this trend. So generally jumping about two hours a day of added screen time is now increasing more and more uh, as we get more and more screens in our lives. You can kind of think about this program starting because we had a new world filled with iPhones and designing digital didn't just mean designing a website somebody might use, but you're potentially designing a product that somebody will be connected to in every waking moment of their life. And that's a big responsibility. And we need to design better technologies and better designs for people because they're so connected to them. And so designing for digital means designing with an understanding of people and what their lives are like. That's what I mean when I talk about designing for experience. Here from the digital, the Interaction Design Foundation, sort of one of the big uh, communities and resources online for interaction design, a good user experience is one that meets the particular user's needs in the specific context where he or she uses the product. And so that means if you want to study how to design a better product, you then have to understand the person who will use it. And we frame all of our products around this framing device, uh, the, the good user experience being one about studying people. Uh, we'll look at it in three ways. So we understand the person, who they are, the persona we create to represent them, uh, the scenario they're in, where are they, what time of year is it, what time of day is it, all these factor into the example and the goal, what do they have in mind? What do they want to achieve? Uh, always trying to respect what the user is after. Uh, and I'll use user and person interchangeably, uh, but always trying to bring a, a level of empathy and understanding of that person who's gonna use the product. This is the main focus. So to give you an example of what this means, what kind of what it looks like, uh, we can take a look at the example I mentioned earlier uh, of the airport a really big system, a really big service, the thing that requires a lot of parts to move together to create a good experience. And I'm sure anyone who's traveled uh, has a lot of stories about good and bad experiences traveling overseas or in the air. Uh, it's a source of a lot of anxiety for a lot of people. It brings a whole host of emotions and decision-making alongside this experience. And so if you're gonna design something for the air travel experience, it's kind of hard to know where to start. How would you design something that would improve that experience for somebody? Uh, and this is pretty emblematic of the thing we, things we have to encounter in a lot of our design projects. You start a project and you could go in any direction you, you wanted to. So how do you choose? How do you design, decide where to go? Uh, and so one of the biggest things we do in the very beginning of the project is thinking about what are the specific reasons why people are doing something? So in the case of, uh, an airline example, why are people there? What are they trying to do? Uh, and it can be as easy as uh, you know, going on vacation. So what are the goals of people on vacation? Well, it's relaxation, it's going on an adventure, all these things bring along expectations. So uh, I turned over to the chat a little bit if people want to offer some suggestions. What are some of the reasons why people go on trips and use airplanes to go to other places. If you can't speak for yourself, you know, people that you might have talked to, why have they used uh, planes and airports to go to different places? Uh, a couple of people here, vacations to experience new things or for business. Necessity with time constraints. Yeah, so Jen and Bonnie settle on two very similar kinds of things, speed and time constraints. So you maybe have a week off and you want to go somewhere else. And so you don't want to spend a lot of time in transit. Uh, and that might be very similar for a business person as well. They also don't want to spend a lot of time in between if they have to go somewhere for business. And so going on a plane becomes very much about not wanting to spend any extra time. And so things like delays become a major problem for that type of person. We can start to shape a persona around a particular pain point, you know, that when things delay your trip or they're taking extra time or you have 
a really long layover in a city that isn't your final destination, all those things become these small problems that could become bigger problems over time. And so as a designer, you look to those things, what we call pain points, and we try and reduce them in some way. A couple of other pain points we can talk about, uh, other than necessarily just being in a hurry, uh, being in a foreign place. So anyone who's traveled to another place where they don't speak your same language, um, that can be an incredibly alienating experience. And so how do we communicate to people who probably will bring a, a bunch of different languages to that space? How do we all get everyone working together kind of universally? Uh, when things get delayed or if people get rerouted, how do we make that as pleasant an experience as possible uh, while keeping everybody kind of on track? And so when you design for people in that space, when you design for uh, alleviating some of those pain points, we kind of consider the psychology of the user and how they make decisions. Uh, and a good example I like to bring up in class a lot is the car theory of user psychology, where you can kind of think about the user as a car traveling down the highway. You're, they're looking for their exit. They're looking for a particular exit they need to leave on. Uh, and they're constantly scanning their environment to look for signs, signs that they're in the right place, that they need to uh, take the next exit or not. And you have a couple of key moments to get that sign in front of their face before they pass it. Uh, and so even if you're designing for somebody in an airport, you're thinking about how they're making decisions. You know, what do I need to do when I land? How quick is my layover? How fast do I have to get through the terminal? Do I know this place? Uh, what kinds of signs do I need to look out for to make sure I'm going in the right direction and that I'm going to make it to my destination on time? And so if you're thinking about air travel and you're thinking about going somewhere, uh, you know, through the kind of like uh, air travel industry, uh, you want to think about designing something with what the user needs in mind. Uh, what do they need in that moment? What do they need to prepare ahead of time? Uh, what are they looking for? And then you put words and symbols and graphics in front of their eyes to get them to the right destination. So we think about the signage that they would see when they first leave the plane. You think about any messages that would need to be delivered to them as they're sitting in the chair before they leave the plane. And then as they are in the airport, how do they navigate that space and how do they get to where they need to go? So these are the big questions. These are sort of the big things that we are trying to get people to think about as they navigate. Uh, and it becomes a big part of our goals within the digital experience design program to kind of think about these questions uh, and think about how to design for people in that space. These are, uh, again, from the Digital Experience Design, uh, Innovate Interaction Design Foundation, uh, some common problems in, 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 in interface design, where you have uh, things that people are looking for, but potentially they might get lost because they're unclear about where they need to go. Maybe they have not seen the layout of the airport before, or they don't necessarily know how uh, different layouts and uh, airports are organized logically, and so they're just kind of lost, taking turn after turn, trying to figure out where to go until they find somebody that can help them. Or the words they're looking for aren't there. They're looking around at signs and they're looking for things they think they know. Maybe they've read it in an app or a book somewhere and they're looking at the signs and none of the words make sense to them. And so they don't know what to do with that information. Or the words that might that they're looking for are there. They're on a sign somewhere, but they just can't see it because there's too much going on, it's too chaotic. And I'm sure this is something we've all kind of experienced uh, in some way, where you have this idea of signage being present, but because there's too many signs or if they're in, located in a weird place that the user just doesn't know where to find it. And these same concepts, these same problems from design for an airport translate really well to digital experience design as well. That when you're looking through a website, if you're not clear on the concept of the website, if you're not clear how it's organized, you're going to get lost. The words you're looking for might not be there. Your person who wrote that website just used the wrong terminology that you're not familiar with, or there's too much going on, too chaotic. With this example from the Vancouver airport, uh, you're walking off the plane, you're trying to make it to your uh, uh, next flight really quickly, and this is the first sign that you see. Welcome to Vancouver, bienvenue à Vancouver. So you have this language there. If you don't speak those, you can still see Vancouver, so you know you're in the right city, at least. 
And they have two symbols, one that kind of looks like an airplane. And one, if you're good, maybe you understand that you know that that looks like a baggage and you could follow that to baggage claim. But we could improve that. We can improve that design by being more clear about what the user wants to do, right? This way to transfers, this other way to baggage claim. And I'm sure there's more signs there uh, afterwards, but the idea is that you want to get the right signs to people at the right time. So when we're studying design and interaction, we have a bunch of different things we want to start thinking about. Uh, and so we have uh, things like uh, the, the core questions of what does the user want, uh, what needs to be included for the user to actually do what they want to do. Uh, and so as we move up through these different questions from sort of the bottom up, we work our well, ourselves towards that surface level, that interface, that sign on the surface of a bunch of deeper questions. And this is what we do in all of our projects is we try to figure out these initial steps first so that when we get up to the top, that surface level, we kind of know what to provide for people, that there's a integrity behind the interface because of these questions we've asked before. So let's take a look at an example. And there's sort of uh, uh, experience uh, scenario. You are going to write uh, an essay or a letter or something, and you sit down at your computer to type it out. Sort of the follow-up to the typewriter is the word processing dot, uh, program. One of the very first graphical user interfaces that was ever developed uh, was built for this purpose. Uh, and here we see two examples, the one on the left, uh, Microsoft Word, and the one on the right, uh, Apple Pages. And these are two very capable programs. They have been used by millions of people uh, to write everything from dissertations to love letters. And you have this thing that gives you a bunch of different tools for writing. And I asked the question to the people in chat here, which one do you prefer? Which one is better? Which one do you think provides a better experience? Let's see what people think here. Bonnie says here, first one for me, because that's what I'm used to. Uh, and Andrew says, I personally like the Windows experience. Yeah. And I think that there is uh, a lot to be learned from those two responses. And this is something we get a lot when I give this example, um, that there is this idea that when we design things, we might design them with the best of intentions. There's a lot of ideas behind what makes Apple a design company, a design first company, where they think about how to make things look good and have sort of the most aesthetic qualities. But at the end of the day, it's what, what people personally like. And so it's a very personal question. So when we talk about having to design experience, understanding people is about knowing preference. It's about knowing how they think and how they'll be looking around for things that are familiar to them and that they like. But the idea is like with this with Microsoft Word doesn't look super aesthetic. It is familiar. And that is a very powerful thing for people. Uh, and you know, if you ask any group of people, they will answer with the thing that they're most familiar with, that they're most comfortable with. Um, and users will answer in the exact same way. They'll use the thing that they are familiar with and comfortable with. And so I asked this question not because there's a right or wrong answer here, um, but because it highlights a lot of the ways in which we have to approach design in digital experience design. Uh, let's look at another example here. So we've got uh, uh, this scenario where you're waking up in the morning, you're going to go on uh, a day trip somewhere, um, probably outside, so you're gonna check the weather. What do you need to be thinking about? So if we take an example, I'm gonna go have uh, a day in the park with my family. You know, it's a, maybe a birthday party, we're gonna go throw a ball around, we're gonna have a barbecue. We wanna check the weather. So we think about what the user wants out of that. They want to be able to know what to expect, how to anticipate the weather. We're trying to alleviate any pain points where the user gets to the park 
and finds out they don't have enough clothes to wear because it's colder than they expected or they didn't bring any sunscreen because it's too hot and very sunny and they weren't prepared for it. And so what kinds of things, and I asked for this to the chat again, what kinds of things would you want to see on a website that has the weather? After you do that little Google search, uh, you know, Edmonton weather, what would you hope to see? I have a couple examples here, temperature, precipitation. What else? What else would you want to see? Andrew says air quality. Absolutely. This has been one of the biggest things in the last year, and our technologies are responding to that right now, uh, is that people are very concerned about air quality. Do I need to bring a mask with me? Is this going to be something where I just don't even want to leave the house at all? Uh, because there's a forest fire somewhere nearby, and all that smoke is being uh, carried into the city. Anything else that we need to think about providing to the user? UV index, humidity, absolutely. Yeah. So we can kind of think in our head a couple of different things. Oh, yeah. Simon has a good point here. Last updated. So knowing if this information is updated and live, you know, some kind of uh, information that kind of gives a timestamp or something. So all these questions that were coming up in our mind right now, you have to think about like, oh, how do I put that onto the screen? And one of the things we can do as designers is think about hierarchy. Uh, what should be the biggest, the first thing that the user sees? Because if they're that car traveling down the highway, you don't have a lot of time. You have to get it right in front of their face as quickly as possible. And so here we might think about, okay, temperature is probably going to be the first thing. We want to know what is the temperature now? What's going to be in the in the, in a little bit of time? And then what's the general weather like? And then we can kind of think like, what is the order from there? So probably temperature, you know, sunny or cloudy, then probably air quality or UV index, maybe humidity underneath that, and then maybe a timestamp would be the smallest thing on the page. And so if we take a look at uh, those two examples, uh, I won't open it live, but I have here screenshots from yesterday uh, that I took. And the two examples here, the Weather Channel on the left-hand side and the Government of Alberta, a uh, Government of Canada, rather, uh, uh, web page as well. So these are the two top hits that you might find on Google. Uh, you might find yourself on either one of these without necessarily thinking too hard. And so we can calculate for ourselves as designers, do we think that these things perform well? What can we do to improve them graphically? Well, the one that left actually does a really good job of thinking about that hierarchy. When you first scan it, even if you spent a split second on that page, you'd get the number 18 that would be burned into your brain. And that means that even without thinking about it too hard, you know, 18 degrees. Is that Celsius, Fahrenheit? It didn't, we didn't necessarily pick that up, but we'll just assume that that's Celsius. And then we have mostly cloudy. And they've even done something interesting here where they have the icon of the cloudy with a little bit of sun, where we can, again, scan very quickly, where that car on the highway, we see a symbol, we know what we're doing. But they also have this graphic in the background. The visuals that add that little bit of interest reinforce that cloudiness, kind of a picture or window into what the sky might look like. And then they have the air quality index, another number, slightly smaller than the other number of 18 degrees, but still pretty prominent with a little bit of a color indicator. It's the yellow level of, of moderate uh, air quality uh, in the air at the moment. And then other things down the page, seasonal allergy count. Um, we don't necessarily have humidity, um, although that might be something you might find further down the page, uh, but we have rain ending around 8.15. That's pretty nice. I can predict my future. I know exactly when to think about, uh, you know, maybe bringing an umbrella or a raincoat or something. And then we have the, the radar underneath there. And if you compare that to the example on the right, it's probably still functional. And there's probably people just like the Microsoft example that like that version better because it's something they're used to, because there's something that they know and they know how to use it. But for most people, the idea of this good design comes in, call, in the form of answering the questions they had when they first arrived at the site. What did they want? Can we deliver it to them as quickly as possible? And so this shows this difference between something that's been intentionally designed around a good experience and something that is just providing a function for people. And this is something we grapple with a lot in these problems. 
A digital experience should not bother us with questions that you should already know, right? So it shouldn't burden us with making too many choices. And to create a good experience, digital technology should respect who we are, what we want, and where we live. And so by looking at those things, by studying people, we actually understand how to make better digital products. This is a big part of strategy at Google right now, where a couple of years ago, they launched their digital well-being initiative as they tried to figure out how to create better products for people. Uh, Google being one of the things that pretty much everyone on the planet has used. Uh, statistically, most people have the internet at this point. Uh, even in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, in the most for most remote regions of the world, uh, people have internet and have probably at some point interacted with a Google product. And so making stuff that make people feel better, that improve their lives, is a big part of what they're trying to do. So digital well-being here, defined by Google, is a state of satisfaction that people achieve when digital technology supports their intentions. And this then creates something that uh, affects well-being across a wide variety of dimensions. The example they use here about how digital technology is hindering people. So this is certainly something I'm sure you've all experienced in the past where you, you want to go to sleep or you, know, you have work to do and you open your phone. Maybe you got an update or text message and you find yourself on Facebook or on a website somewhere, or on Twitter, and all of a sudden you realize an hour is gone. And you haven't even thought about it. Whatever you were doing before is totally gone. It has left your mind entirely. This is this response we've had to digital technology in our lives that we're trying to avoid now. We're realizing that it's not good for us. And so we're trying to design better things. And we do that by designing something that actively understands what we're trying to do and encourages and empowers us to do it. So in this example here, the intention of the user is to contact a friend who lives in another country. They used digital technology, in this case, a video calling platform to call that person. And that they does so in as easy a, a way as possible. And then at the end of it, they're able to say, okay, I called them, I did that. And they're actually able to leave the digital environment entirely because it supported them doing that thing they came to the digital technology to do. And so by thinking about all of our products as these encapsulated scenarios that help people do things they want to do, we have really good experiences. And this is the sort of backbone behind new products that are coming out right now. So one of the sort of local examples that I have been thinking about a lot lately is point of sale systems. Specifically, if you go to any restaurant or coffee shop, these are very common experiences for people. Most people at some point will interact with new digital uh, point of purchase or point of sale systems, things like Square, where you go and buy a coffee and then the uh, time to pay comes up and you're gonna pay with card and the barista turns this screen to you, this iPad essentially, that has a bunch of buttons on them. And you have to then uh, uh, enter your, your you know, card, whether that's a tap or whatever, and then a tip at the end. And so we kind of think like, what is the scenario there? What are the pain points uh, that people have? They're in a hurry, very much similar to what we talked about with the airport. You know, there's lots of things to navigate. Maybe it's a new place and they are unfamiliar with all of the options they could choose from, right? Anyone going to a fancy coffee shop knows that it's intimidating because it's, it's a very cool place. You don't want to, you know, disrupt the etiquette or the norms of that place, but you also want to participate in it. Could just be it's a really noisy place and you have a hard time communicating across the counter to the other person. All these things are opportunities for design, but specifically digital design, we can think about that iPad interface. And I'm sure this is something you've seen a lot yourself uh, has become more and more common, this tipping screen, that this is a digital solution replacing something we did more tangibly in the past, where after making a purchase, you'd have a couple of dollars in your wallet and you'd make a calculus in your head about how much that person across the counter uh, should be tipped how much their service uh, adds a value on top of the cost of the actual product. Um, and these things are understandably cultural. They're very different here in Edmonton than they are in the US, even though culturally we look very similar. They're very different between here and Europe, which are also very different, although we look very similar. And as you go around to different countries around the world, 
tipping cultures change. And so how do you design digital systems to accommodate that? And how can that go wrong? So here we see an example that is helpful in some way because we don't have to calculate in our brains, what is 15% of you know, my 374 coffee? It does it for me, it calculates that for me. But in calculate it for me, it also takes choice away from me. My intention might be to tip less than that or somewhere between 15 and 20%, but it's not making that easy for me. And so here becomes a whole host of different questions. How would you design a better tipping system? How do you design something that isn't as controlling? So here's something we've seen a lot lately and that people are actually tipping more than they are comfortable tipping because they're presented with options. And with these three options here, there's actually five options, but people normally ignore the bottom two because they're not as easy to scan. Remember that hierarchy thing comes back from before. So these first three options, 15, 20, and 25%, what do you, what do you, what would you pick as somebody who's looking at that screen? I guess survey of the people in the chat, what would you pick from those? Someone says 15. So depending on where you're from, you might be inclined to pay 12, which used to be the, the most common thing. And then even before then was 10, um, you know, as we sort of built up uh, a kind of like inflation of tipping over the years, most people as studies are showing are picking that middle option because people don't want to be seen as being cheap you know, I think Simon, you adding that comment is very revealing of people's psychology uh, is that, you know, picking 15, that's a perfectly reasonable tipping amount, but there's a, this association with being cheap because there are two other options that are more. People don't want to necessarily say, I want to pay the most because they are strapped for cash. And so people will pick the middle option and whatever that middle option is doesn't really matter, but they will pick that middle option because of those ways that we think. And so this is the way that digital technology controls us in some way. And so in, unless we figure out how best to design products, and we design them with respect for people in mind from the beginning, we will create things that take advantage of people's psychology. We'll design things that control people in some small but significant ways. And that if you're designing something, how does it start to manipulate you in some way, right? How does it start to put things in front of you that make you do things you're not necessarily comfortable doing? And so if you have something like this, you might end up paying more and the person on the other side of the counter in that moment might get more, a few more cents or a dollar more than they normally would have in a pre-digital system. This stuff starts to affect us over time, right? Just like those Google well-being projects are, are about being this ongoing usage uh, uh, consideration. A tipping thing will slowly erode the relationship that person has with that business because they always feel like they're giving more than they are really comfortable giving. But that's part of this question of user experience design, that these systems can either positively or negatively affect us. And the experience comes down to us understanding what people are comfortable with, us understanding what people are expecting and helping and encouraging them to be able to do that. So that's sort of the... Uh, brief overview of what it means to design digital products. Uh, and these things translate to things that are as big as government systems that provide subsidies and help for anyone who's a citizen of that government, all the way down to small things like uh, games and small things you might use on an iPhone for three seconds at a time. Uh, all these things have these same considerations. And by learning these systems, uh, you can learn to design better products.